I've lived in the United States for 13 years now and recently moved, three years ago, moved with my family, my two young sons, my wife, here to Vermont. And in all of the 13 years I've been living in the United States, no one has ever said to me, go back to where you come from. So, the topic of my conversation tonight is a just and sustainable world. And I want to read a quote that will set the scene for this lecture. I had the opportunity earlier this week to visit the African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, D.C. An absolutely amazing facility that traces the history of the African American experience in this country from the early days of slavery to cultural, sporting, political, and other successes. And one of the quotes that I read that really stood out for me and helped me to organize my thoughts for today's talk was from the eminent philosopher Cornell West. And I want to read you the quote from Cornell West. He said, America needs citizens who love it enough to reimagine and remake it. Mm. I'm going to read that again. America needs citizens who love it enough to reimagine and remake it. Now there's a number of reasons why this quote means so much to me during the course of this particular week. In part because during the course of the last week we have learned that being a critic, being someone who is proposing a different future for this country is something that can get you into serious difficulty. And yet what Cornell West is saying is that critic, criticism, being willing and brave enough and courageous enough to put out a blueprint for a better future is actually an expression of love. So when we gather here to talk about what a better future might look like, and when we invest our time in creating that better future, we are not investing only in the planet, we're investing in the future of this country and we're investing in the future of our neighbors. It is important for us to continue to be critics. It's important for us to be constructive in that criticism. What he's also doing is he's inviting us to reimagine the future, but he's actively asking us to get involved in remaking. It's not just a philosophical exercise, it's a form of activism. And so what I want to do at my talk this evening is first of all ask you to work with me, invite you in fact, to reimagine what the future might look like, but then secondly, to talk about what you might do in your daily lives as individuals as neighbors, as small business owners, to not only remake this country, but to remake the planet in partnership with your neighbors here in Vermont, your neighbors across the country, and indeed your neighbors in every other country around the world. So I'm going to start with the issue of what it means to reimagine the future. And I want to begin by talking about the narrative that we hear all the time about climate change. And that is a narrative about the upcoming apocalypse. It's a narrative about a future that we have to fear. How greenhouse gases caused by human activities are changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere, how that is changing natural and ecosystem services, and how that in turn affects the way we live our lives. The places where we live, the food that we can eat, the fresh water we have access to, the livelihoods we can have that will support our future and our family, the human rights that we take for granted. What I want to do is to use the story of climate justice to instead change that narrative to one about the better future that we are now on the cusp of building. Climate justice is first and foremost an opportunity for us to re-diagnose the problem. Because for the past 25 years, our understanding of climate change has been greenhouse gas emissions, polar bears, and ice caps. It's fundamentally been an environmental conversation that leads us to environmental solutions. And one of the things we need to do is to re-diagnose the problem so that we can put in place the proper solutions to this challenge that we face. So what do I mean by re-diagnose the problem? If you look at the impacts of climate change that we're experiencing right around the world today, from the wildfires in California to the floods in the Midwest, to vector and waterborne diseases in New England, to extreme weather events like hurricanes in Florida, to cyclones in Africa and heat waves right across the world, you'll find a commonality in all of them. And that is that those who are most marginalized, low-income populations, people of color, women, indigenous people, the elderly, the young, and the disabled, 
those people who suffer structural forms of discrimination, whether it is societal or cultural, economic, legal or political, those people are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And the reason why that happens is because their human rights have not been respected. Their voices have not been heard. They have not been participants in the political process. They are excluded from economic activity and shared prosperity. It is only when we diagnose this as a problem not of environmental systems, but of socio-ecological systems, including structural discrimination, that we can begin to put in place the right sorts of solutions to overcome this challenge we face. Which means all of you need to leave here today, not just as advocates of the environment, but as advocates of your fellow human beings. And you must make sure that the policy solutions that you advocate for are those that help to overcome human rights abuses and structural discrimination and advance the causes of these marginalized populations around our state, around the country, and around the world. So the first thing is that climate justice provides us with an opportunity to diagnose the problem. The second thing is that it gives us a prescription for how, how we go about designing the solutions. So for example, one of the most effective ways we can tackle climate change and rising greenhouse gas emissions is to put in place a carbon price. There are many ways that we can put in place a carbon price, through an emissions trading system, through a carbon tax. But when we put in place these carbon prices, we have to make sure that they are put in place alongside social safeguards that protect the most vulnerable people in society. We have to make sure that they're designed in a way whereby the polluter pays the price of the pollution and not the ordinary working man or woman. We have to make sure that as we're designing solutions, it's not just an economy-wide emissions reductions target or the next energy policy, but that it's things like a living wage. It's things like expanding healthcare, so that if you are sick, you don't have to worry about not getting a paycheck because you miss tomorrow's working day, and therefore you can gather together the financial resources you will need to rebuild your life when an extreme weather event hits. So climate justice is also about how we go about designing these instruments. And this is something, for example, that our lawmakers in Montpelier and our lawmakers in Washington have unfortunately neglected to incorporate into how they go about the business of making laws and policies. The third very important part about climate justice is that it helps us to assign responsibility. And it helps us to understand that the principal cause of the problem we face today is a climate inequality. It is the consumption and production habits of the wealthiest people in the world. It is the fact that we produce food that is wasted in ways that are unproductive and damaging to our soils, to our land, and to our populations. It's the fact that we produce energy that is wasted between the source of production and the end use. It's the fact that we are encouraged to buy cars that can last for 20 years, but the marketing departments at car companies want us to replace those cars every three years. It is the inevitable consequence of a lifestyle and a system of materialism and consumption that we are faced with on a daily basis. And that is too often out of reach for the most marginalized and the most vulnerable people around the world. So climate justice helps us to understand that addressing this problem requires not just a new policy, it requires systems change, it requires cultural change, and that we must embrace that cultural change and in fact lead it. Lead it. But then finally, climate justice is really important because it gives us a vision of the future we're trying to create. Over the course of the next 15 years, we will spend trillions of dollars right around the world changing our energy system, changing our industrialization processes, changing our patterns of urbanization, changing our land use habits. If after all of that money being spent, if we're successful and we decarbonize the global atmosphere, and yet we still hand over a world where 60 to 100 million women disappear, where 22,000 children die every day from hunger, where you have people in this town working four jobs 80 hours a week and still not having access to health care, and still getting a call on the morning that their shift is about to begin and being told, we don't need you today, therefore you won't get a paycheck today. If we continue to work in the, in, live in a world where power inequality and economic inequality is so rampant, 
then what will that trillions of dollars of spend have been for? What will the purpose have been? Will we be able to count that as a success? My answer is no. If all we do over the next 15 years is change the chemical composition of the atmosphere back to a composition that makes this planet livable, but overlook structural discrimination, human rights abuses, and separate people around this world from shared prosperity and inclusive growth, we as a community will have failed. And we cannot allow that failure to happen. Yes, I. But equally, if we do this properly, then climate justice provides us with the roadmap to this shared prosperity and this inclusive political system and this inclusive economy. Because right now, across the United States, the renewable energy sector is creating jobs 12 times faster than the rest of the economy. Right now in China, the country has created the five largest renewable energy companies in the world. And they're creating millions of jobs domestically in China because they understand that they are going to be a 21st century energy superpower by investing in a 21st century energy infrastructure. While we here at home are investing in a 19th century energy infrastructure in order to preserve 50,000 jobs that are being lost to mechanization and automation. And we're doing that because of the Electoral College and because of our need to gain votes in a limited number of states in the Rust Belt. Similarly, if we begin to invest in sustainable and regenerative agriculture, we'll not only be creating jobs, we'll not only be building the capacity of our soils as carbon sinks, but we will be investing in food sovereignty. We'll be investing in food security. Because this food is locally grown, we will be investing in our neighbors and our communities. These are the jobs of tomorrow, as opposed to investing in large-scale agriculture that takes money out of the state. One of my favorite, but the, one of the most damning statistics about the energy system in Vermont is that for every dollar spent on fossil fuels in this state, 78 cents of that dollar leaves the state. But for the money you invest in renewable energy, you're creating local jobs, you're supporting local entrepreneurs, you're investing in human capital, you're giving people a chance to create their own companies or go and work for another locally owned company. You're providing yourself with energy security. And of course, you're helping to solve the climate problem. So what climate justice does is it helps us to create a narrative where we're not just managing climate risk, but we're talking about job creation and economic development. We're talking about expanding the tax base for a state that desperately needs it. We're talking about retention of our young people so that they can get jobs that pay a living wage and better here rather than having to move away to big cities. So let's start the process of reimagining a future that isn't about managing risk, but is about giving people a vision for what a better tomorrow looks like if we invest in innovation, if we invest in our young people, if we invest in this transformation. The second thing we must do when we have reimagined the future is we must then contribute to making that future a reality. Now, I've worked on this issue for 23 years, and in that time, I've learned more from failure than I've learned from success, because to work on climate change requires a degree of personal resilience. So what I'm going to share with you now is a framework that I've developed that's called Act, Enable, and Influence for how we might go about remaking not only America, but remaking the planet based on our own contribution. So this framework begins with ACT. If we are to be credible advocates, we must be capable of living a lifestyle that reflects our own advocacy. And that means we must be competent and capable of reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions. In climate change, there's an old adage that the problem is essentially food, fuel, and footnotes. Meaning if you really want to be an effective agent of change on this issue, it starts with energy. It starts with reducing your energy use through things like weatherization and energy efficiency in your homes. It moves on to using renewable energy and as much as possible eliminating fossil fuels from your life. That means think about whether you can solarize your home. Think about whether you can feed in to and access energy from renewable energy grids. 
It means thinking about your mobility patterns. Can you use more public transportation? Can you use more bicycles? Can you walk more often? Can you buy an electric vehicle? If not, can you buy a hybrid? Think about your transportation patterns. Think about your consumption habits. Don't buy anything from Amazon when you can buy it from the Northshire bookstore. Yeah. Don't buy anything that is part of a complex global supply chain with large carbon emissions when you can buy from local producers living in your community. It means thinking about what you eat and where that food comes from and what inputs go into the production of that food. Steer clear of food that uses massive herbicides, pesticides loaded with high carbon chemicals. Steer clear from food that is produced in distant places when you can source from farmers in your own community. And also, as much as you possibly can, reduce your intake of red meat. <laughs> if beef was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. If food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet. So think about what you put into your system and think about how much of it is wasted from production to end use and do what you can to cut that out. Once you've gone beyond action, you have to think about the next part of the framework, which is enable. And that means what can you do in your daily lives, in your places of work or business, in your home, to enable other people to become effective leaders on this issue. This starts, for example, with education. How can you educate people within your own sphere so that they understand that climate change is real, that it is caused by humans, that it is accelerating, but importantly, that it can be solved? How can you overcome and defeat the myth that is propagated by our president that climate change is a hoax invented in China? What can you do to make sure that the next generation is properly informed about this issue, that they have access to credible science, that they have mentors in their home and in their community that will help them understand and act on this issue. If you are a small business owner, what can you do to provide goods and services to your neighbors so that they can act and reduce their carbon footprint? And most importantly of all, what can you do to help build a societal consensus in this issue in this country? We have gotten as far as we possibly can on climate change in the United States with 45% people leading on this issue. We've gotten as far as we can get with Liberal Democrats being vocal while Conservative Republicans sit this out. So the most important thing you can do, in fact, if you want to enable others to lead, is to model successful, inclusive conversations on this issue that reach out to those who are not yet converted and enable them to lead on this issue as well. One of my favorite journalists, a man called Mark Shields, who every Friday sits on the PBS NewsHour and gives his opinion on the latest political developments, he always says, I'm looking for converts, not heretics. It's our job, those of us who know this issue and who understand its urgency and who want to see a better world, to stop pointing our fingers at those who disagree with us and instead, put our arms around their shoulders, understand what motivates them, understand what drives and influences them, speak the language they understand, and convert them to our cause. Because if we don't do that, we will go on with a cycle of boom and bust policies, where a Democrat administration leads us forward and a Republican administration leads us backward. We've got to open up a space for those who are not yet converted to join our coalition because only then will we move forward with a societal consensus, and only then will we have not only a just policy, but a sustainable policy. And then finally, act, enable, and then third, influence. We have power, and we often forget that we have power. We often think that this is a problem happening in a distant place, it's a problem that will affect us tomorrow, and it's a problem that other people have the power to solve but we have agency. The first form of agency we have is in the power of the purse. Whatever you buy, however you spend your money, that sends a signal to the marketplace. So if you 
want to influence the private sector on this issue, do it first and foremost by voting with your purse and choosing to buy from those who are leading on this issue and promising yourself that you will no longer buy from those who are regressive on this issue. If you have investments, it is very, very easy for you to sit down with your investment broker and talk about where you want to place your money and back high returns that protect the climate rather than high returns that undermine our planet. So think about how you spend your money. We have people in this gathering this evening who are championing and pioneering approaches to divestment and reinvestment right across our community, talking to schools and churches and colleges and universities and persuading them to take their money out of fossil fuels and to put their money into the economy of tomorrow. Join in that action, join with those people and move your money in a positive way. The second major power we have that is often overlooked and is a luxury we enjoy that is not enjoyed in other parts of the world is we have the power that democracy offers us to voice and vote. When election time comes, you have to go out and interrogate these candidates, every candidate, local, statewide, national. Hold their feet to the fire. Don't only listen to their speeches, look at their records. When you find these candidates, vote based on this issue. This issue often features 9, 10, 15, 20 on the list that people care about. But if we don't tackle climate change, it's very difficult for us to imagine a future of high paying jobs in an inclusive economy. If we don't tackle climate change, it's very difficult for us to protect human health, human security, national security. So this has to be an issue that we truly use when making informed choices amongst candidates. If you can't find a candidate that you can support, then stand for election. In 2016, there were an awful lot of people who decided to sit out an election because they thought, this is chicken and this is fish. Believe me, we would be a lot further ahead on this particular issue if people had decided to make an informed choice as opposed to deciding to sit out an election because they found neither candidate palatable. I remember the day after the election, sitting in my office in Manhattan, and a march was taking place down Broadway, and people were protesting, holding placards, saying, he is not our president. And when polled, 56% of people said they hadn't voted the previous day. When you look at midterm elections, 37% of Americans show up to vote. Now, I know that there are structural reasons why that happens. I know, for example, that the Roberts Court has gutted the Voting Rights Act. I know that that means that voting places have been shut down right across the South. I know that the fact that there isn't a federal holiday on voting day in the United States means that people don't show up to vote because they can't afford to miss a paycheck. I know that there is antiquated infrastructure and technology in voting places right across the United States that would be laughable if they weren't so tragic in any other part of the industrialized world. And that it means people have to queue for five hours in the heat just to cast their ballot. And so people stay away. I know that if you're a Republican living in California, you probably don't think your vote is going to count for much. If you're a Republican in Vermont, you probably think the same. And if you're a Democrat living in Arkansas or Oklahoma or Mississippi, you probably feel the same. So I know that there are structural reasons why people do not show up to vote. But all around this world, in places I have worked, and I've worked on five continents, there are people who are literally dying every day to secure the most precious right of all, and that is the right to be heard in our political process. The right to vote, the right to participate, the right to shape public policy, the right to advocate, the right of freedom of speech, the right of assembly. We have all of those rights here. We have to use them. The next climate activist that I meet who tells me the day after the election that they did not vote is going to be very, very sorry they ran into me in the street. So vote. Thirdly, if you can't find a candidate and you aren't willing to stand yourself, then find somebody in this audience and bend their ear. 
because I know of people in this audience right now who are leaders in our community. I would say some of them are once in a generation leaders. They have been successful in the private sector. They have been successful in advocacy. They are people of ethics and integrity. And over the course of the next year, I'm going to be knocking on their doors and I'm going to be saying, we need you to go out and lead. And the reason I'm saying that is because the leadership we have right now is not fit for purpose. <laughs> right across this state, we have a governor who does some things on climate rather well. He, for example, as a Republican, took the brave step of standing up to President Trump and saying, pull out of Paris if you wish, but we're staying in. He is a governor who stood up and said, we are going to support the California vehicle standards and not backtrack and go along with the new Trump standards. He is a governor who set up a climate commission to make recommendations to the state. He's also a governor that only met with that commission once. He's also a governor that hasn't really followed up on the 53 recommendations of that commission. And he's also a governor who has failed to use his budgetary powers, who has failed to be a leader in Montpelier, and who has truly failed to go around the state and advocate for this issue, and to go around to other Republican governors in the country and advocate for this issue. So although I have a lot of time for this governor when compared to his Republican colleagues across the country, I think it's time for a generational change of governor in this state. And similarly, I'm looking at a Democratic supermajority. And I don't see that Democratic supermajority getting an awful lot done on this issue either. Now maybe that Democratic supermajority is biding its time. And maybe they're being patient. Maybe they're off somewhere cooking up the perfect plan. Kathleen James will be able to tell you a little bit later. I know Kathleen's about to run a roadshow right across the state with the Climate Solutions Caucus. But my message to Kathleen is, let's bring the talking to a rapid end and let's make sure that we get bills before the House as soon as possible that are creative, that are imaginative, that not only address energy, but take a full systems approach, including human rights and social safeguards to this issue. And let's sure that happens now. And similarly, we are now embarked on a presidential election. And we have candidates coming through New Hampshire every single week. We are a little more than one hour away from the New Hampshire border. So we have a role to play in this election. I've already gone to speak publicly on several occasions in New Hampshire, and I would encourage you to take the opportunity of our proximity, go to New Hampshire, make sure the people there are skilled and equipped on this issue, capable of asking the hard questions, that they're interrogating these candidates, and that these candidates are willing to speak with ambition and with sincerity and with authenticity on this issue, and that when the time comes to choose a Democratic candidate, that we're choosing that candidate based on their track record on this issue and their willingness to lead on this issue. Because we have, from a science perspective, no more than 11 years on this issue before we breach dangerous climate thresholds. But from a political perspective, we have the next 18 months. Because President Trump is doing real damage to this agenda, not in terms of the climate deniers and fossil fuel advocates he's putting in place in agencies and departments of the federal government, not even in terms of the policies he is rolling back, not even in terms of withdrawing from the Paris Agreement or defunding the Green Climate Fund, not even in terms of how he's poisoning the public discourse by telling people that this issue is not real, but because he's packing the federal judiciary. An action on climate change at the federal level is dependent on Massachusetts versus EPA from 2007. That was a five to four Supreme Court ruling. That ruling can be overturned. And if it is overturned, not only does it undermine the capacity of this president to lead on this issue, but it will undermine the capacity of any future president to lead on this issue. We cannot afford to have two more Supreme Court justices nominated by Donald Trump. That means this election cycle is pivotal to what we're trying to do domestically and what we're trying to do internationally on this issue. So if you have deep pockets, invest, make sure you vote, and make sure you go out and advocate for this issue. Woo! Now, here is the good news. The good news is that we have begun to reimagine and we have begun to remake. 
As Steve mentioned when he introduced me, I was involved for many years in the preparation of the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is a deal amongst 196 countries around the world. Only one country has signaled its intention to withdraw, and that's the United States. Mm. Of those 196 countries, 189 have national climate action plans. They have made commitments to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, to mobilize trillions of dollars of finance to make that reality happen by the end of this decade. $13.5 trillion alone are going to be spent on clean energy in the next decade. And when you add all the investments in agriculture and land use and transportation, industrial processes, urbanization, and all these other sectors, you're talking about tens of trillions of dollars. That is a real commitment to a different future. The Paris Agreement also has, baked into its architecture, a commitment that every country will continue with this journey and that on five-year cycles they will progressively increase their level of ambition, which means they are not allowed to backslide. They can only move forward and they can only go faster. Believe me, six years ago we would have dreamed of having a text of this kind. We would have dreamed of having a universal agreement of this nature. We would have dreamed of having this level of ambition. But we also know it's just a beginning. It's a foundation upon which to build. And it's our obligation over the coming years to make sure that internationally and domestically we continue with that journey. Second of all, the private sector has begun to move on this issue. Now, for people like me who've built a career working on environment, I'm used to looking at companies as being the enemy of what I'm trying to achieve. I'm used to seeing a company as the lobbyist who walks in to talk to my minister after I've spent seven years drafting a policy and who tells that minister at the very last minute to pull the plug. But I can tell you, as someone who has a healthy dose of skepticism about multinational companies, that over the course of the last six years, many of these companies have become our most powerful allies on this issue. Today, there are 6,000 companies around the world who collectively are worth $36 trillion, or half the global economy, and they have made climate commitments. Many of them have made the most ambitious type of climate commitment, which is a science-based target, a commitment to take on board their fair share of this burden, not only within their own operations, but right across their supply chains, which span the entire world. Which means, if you are now a dairy company in Ireland, you are getting questionnaires from 13 major multinational companies, each of them saying to you, if you don't reduce your emissions, we won't buy from you anymore. Because we're not buying low cost from now on, we're buying low carbon. This has huge implications for the way the market works, for the economic stimulus that's provided to innovation and low carbon development. So my message to you is, many of these companies are now on our side. It's time for us to think about how we work with them as allies to continue with the journey going forward. And then the third thing that I would say is that if you've participated in SolarFest today, you will have seen people reimagining and remaking all around you. You will have seen people like my friend Bill Laberge reimagining and remaking our understanding of renewable energy and our access to it. You will have seen people like Jesse McDougall talking about regenerative agriculture and how that is not only a solution for climate change, but it's a solution for food sovereignty and local economic prosperity. You will have seen people talking about the transportation systems of today and tomorrow. You will have seen people talking about what a net zero home looks like. You'll even have talked and spoken and listened to people talking about urine as fertilizer. Yeah. What that means is you've witnessed innovation in practice. And it's the innovation and it's the authenticity and it's the sincerity of people in our community and people in communities like this in every corner of the globe. That innovation, that authenticity, that is the ground for optimism. Because I can promise you, the narrative of fear does not get people activated and mobilized. People get activated and mobilized when they think that tomorrow is going to be better than today. When they think that their activism is going to deliver prosperity for themselves and their family. So I really strongly encourage you, take what you've learned today, go out and build a societal consensus, 
Use the agency that you have, whether that's your economic or your political agency. Continue to advocate for this issue. My final word, however, is that our advocacy has to be sophisticated because the opponents of this agenda are sophisticated. They understand that the way you shape change is by shaping policy. They understand when they go to speak to a member of the House, member of the Congress, somebody working for the World Bank, that you go in with a solution in your pocket. Sometimes that solution is campaign finance support. Sometimes it's a ready-made bill that they can build their reputation upon. What they don't do is they don't write placards and take every opportunity to march down the street. Now, I'm a great believer in protest and marches as an opportunity to open up a space for action, as an opportunity to raise awareness on an issue. But protest and marches cannot be the end of our activism. It can only be the beginning of it. The end of our activism has to be understanding how companies work and how you influence them how public policy works and how to shape it. It has to be about understanding that what excites us does not necessarily excite the person we're talking to, which means it has to be about understanding a new vocabulary of arguments. It has to be about listening to the audience rather than just speaking to them. It has to be about building coalitions with people we would not previously have worked with. It has to be about putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations. I love the fact that I was invited to speak here today. And I love the fact that I'm often invited to speak all over the region. But I'm still dreaming and longing for the opportunity to go and speak to an audience of people who fundamentally disagree with me and are willing to have their minds changed. So one of the things I encourage you to do as my final note is, don't just go out and seek the people whose mind you're trying to change, but also be open to having your own mind changed model that behavior as well as the low carbon climate resilient behavior. And that's how we begin the process of building a climate consensus. I would like to finish by thanking you once again. I'm so sorry you had to sit here in the heat and the humidity and listen to me drone off after that wonderful music. As I always say at the end of every talk, I'm a local resident. You will see me around every coffee shop in the area. Always feel free to come up and chat. Always feel free to seek an opinion if you would like one. But please always feel free to come and tell me that you disagree, that you have a better idea. My vocation is to work on this issue for the rest of my career, the rest of my life. I'm very, very grateful that I have many of you, if not all of you, as my partners in this journey as I go forward. And I can assure you that I will be your partner as long as I live in this community. So thank you very much.